Everyone's happy about snow. Snow's too wonderful for us. It does so much for us. Now, I got told, though, when it's cold, really, really super cold, that's when the mosquitoes really love it. So we've kind of been blessed because we've had a warm winter, so the mosquitoes don't like it because their eggs can't develop properly, apparently. So that's what I got told by Roger Bailey, and I'm going to trust him since he lives in the woods most of his life. He knows these things. Today, we're going to be discussing on our faith issue, the last one for the series, is how do we know God recognizes our faith? Well, he praises us when we witness and we minister for him. And that's going to be our topic today, witnessing and ministering for him. Now, I like to go through bookstores like Ollie's. If you've been to Ollie's, okay, yeah, we're already there. Great. So I like the how-to books, but not the ones that make sense, like how to build a cabinet or how to cook. Those are obvious, important things. I like the ones that make you go, why? Why did they have to write this? And the first one is how to make friends. Now, these are the top five books that have been researched in 2019. Keep that in mind. These are the random ones. These are ones lots and lots of people looked at. And to make friends, I understand that. Because when we look at the cultures of the teenagers through college age now, most of their lives are in phones. They don't know how to personally talk to someone. Because it's all through emails and text and emojis and all this other. So for them to actually sit down and look at you eye to eye, very, very difficult. But now the next one makes me wonder where I'm eating at. Because keep in mind, there's a huge amount of readers on this topic on how to eat roadkill. I have been in the mountainous areas of where Mount Grundy is, if you're familiar with that, it's a missions. And there was a place called Smash Burgers on the side of the road out in Nomad's Land. And I'm thinking, they have cars there. They have customers. Why? Because there's nothing around. It's not McDonald's. It's not Burger King. It's nothing. And all of a sudden, here you find Smash Burgers. So we joked around about, in our group, like, oh, we know what they're cooking there. Anything smashed on the road. That makes me think that might be absolutely true. The next one is, another one, they make tons of movies about it. How to Survive a Zombie Apocalypse. Why would you want to survive that? I've seen the movies. The people who survive do not live pleasantly. It's horrible. Just take me on home. The next one is how to become a grown-up and 468 easy steps. <laughs> I really would have loved to read that book before I became a grown-up and someone still questioned that, that I still need to read that book. But to simplify it for people, how to become a grown-up, who's reading that book? It's a life experience thing. It's you learn from growing up. And now they simplified it in 468 easy steps. Not 20 easy steps, but it takes 468. That's amazing. And the last one really bothers me. How to read. If you're looking for a book on, on to learn how to read, how do you know what that book title says? You can't read it. So what? who is picking up that book? Who's trying to say, oh, well, this looks like a book could teach me how to read. So let me start opening and looking. Well, I can't read a thing in it, though. Or is it someone else trying to teach someone else how to read? I'm, I'm stunned by that, and that is the best one of all. So during my research on how-to books, I decided, let's explore this topic. How to witness. Has anyone simplified how to witness? Because when I was in college, it was a lot of theological ideas. It was a lot of high-end thinking on when you witness to someone. You've got to bring all these big ideas to people. And there was college professors who wrote books on it, and yeah, if you're a college student, it was easy to understand and follow. So here's what I found on the internet by a guy who simplified it. First one is, do read your Bible. I mean, if you don't read your Bible, what are we going to talk about? The next one is, do know what you believe. Because if you don't know what you believe in your faith, then you're just a fish flopping on the ground. <laughs> do memorize appropriate scripture. Now, I have a memory issue. I have a hard time memorizing scriptures. But if you throw a Bible name at me, I can pretty much tell you their story. But I can't memorize scriptures. I mean, I can, but it's like three I hold in my head at all times, and that's it. More than that, my brain says, I don't think so. We ain't got room, Ron. We got too much other stuff in there. So our youth minister, when I was growing up, was teaching us teenagers how to witness. He said, look, I understand you guys are teenagers, especially you guys. Your brains go this way, that way, this way, that way, 24-7. 
So it's easy enough if you take this pocket New Testament with you and you take the book of Romans and you map it out for witnessing. It's called the road, Romans Road of Witnessing. And you put tabs and a number, one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. And you put the tab where that scripture is and you highlight that scripture so it's easy for you to witness to the kids in the youth group, not to the outside kids. He didn't want to make it rough on the shed. He goes, we've got kids in our youth group. They're on the fence. We're going to take you and teach you how to reach your peers, your friends for now. It worked successfully. I liked it. <coughs> the next one is, do start with a positive witness. Don't do this, the author says. Yo, you know, you, you kind of want to hear about Jesus? You know, well, I kind of want to tell you about him, but I'm not really thrilled about it, so, hey, you know, we just talk another day, right? That's what we do. The next one is, keeping it simple. Have you ever met someone who wants to talk to you about God, but they want to bring all these huge ten-letter words into it? Ideology, theology, all these bigologies, and you're like, what? I'm just reading Noah's Ark here. What are you talking about? The author says, keep it simple. Keep it plain. If a child can understand it, you're good to talk about it. Finally, do you use breath mints? Because it's hard to hear the words of life from the breath of death. <laughs> just saying. All right. So then the next one is the don'ts. There are some obvious don'ts you don't do. The first one is, do not wear sunglasses. You ever tried to talk to someone who's wearing sunglasses? You're wondering, are they looking at you and are they talking to you? Or are they studying something else? Anyone who wears sunglasses bothers me at times if we're trying to talk or if I'm in a setting with them. Because I'm wondering, what are they looking at? Is there something I should be looking at? That, some kind of paranoid in a light way. i got to know everyone around me and i got to know everything going on around me. And if I don't, I'm not a happy camper. And i got to figure out people, too. So if you're wearing sunglasses, I'm kind of afraid what you're looking at that might be important that I should have looked at. So when you're trying to witness to someone, they can't see the eye contact. They can't see the importance. So don't wear sunglasses. The next one is don't chew gum because it's hard to talk in a conversation with a cow. <laughs> you know what I mean. Someone's chewing gum like, yep, 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 know about me, gum. Don't chew gum. The next one is don't try to witness to someone who's jogging. <laughs> that one made me think for a minute. Are you serious? You're running along with someone. They've got earbuds in their ears. They're focused on jogging and you're trying to witness to them. Someone's going to trip on a, a step in the curb here or on the sidewalk somewhere. Or they're going to run into a tree. They're going to run into someone else. That is not the time to talk to someone while you're exercising at the gym. Don't do those things. The next one is don't be weird. And by what that means, like, Hey, hey, come here, come here, come here, come here. I want to tell you a secret. Uh, let's step into my car. I want to witness you in my car. Hey, hey, let's go to this dark corner over here in this restaurant. I want to talk to you about Jesus. Hey, 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 why don't you come to my house one evening, kind of make it late, so I can talk to you about Jesus. That's the illustrations he gave with his don't be weird. And I'm like, absolutely, I run from you. Even if I do know you, you try to get me in that situation. Don't get into someone's personal space. You know what I'm talking about. The guy that gets right up in your nose and stands right here and talks to you and yells as if you're a mile away. Bubbles are important for hearing, for visual, and just for personal space. And he says, don't step on someone's toes and stand toe to toe and try and witness to them. They're going to push you back and ignore you. And finally, don't just, oh, also, I'm sorry, don't talk like a nut, you know, the guy who talks like this at 900 miles an hour. Hey, you know about this? I'm going to tell you about Jesus. Do you know about Jesus? I'm going to tell you about Jesus. Jesus, all that. Which I'm told, sometimes when you get me in certain topics, I talk like that. Finally, don't respect the law, disrespect the laws or the authorities. And he's saying, don't go into malls where they say no soliciting and try to plead the amendments where you can talk where you want and do what you want when you want. He says, if the authority comes up to you and says, this is not the place and time, you're saying, absolutely, thank you very much, have a nice day. Don't be disrespectful. So he says, when it comes to witnessing, there are points that apparently we need to understand. And not always do we understand these points. And sometimes we want to break some of those rules, and when we do, it's not going to be a good thing for anyone. So that is the case in point with today's story that we're going to go into. 
the do's and don'ts. And sometimes, when God says, this is what I want you to do, and this is what I don't want you to do, we get stubborn, don't we? We say, I'm sorry, God. I'm going to do what I want to do because I know this is what's going to make me happy. This is what I want to do, God. I know you probably don't want me to do it, but you're going to get over it. You're going to move past it, God. At some point in time, you're going to forgive me, and I'm all good with that. And that's some point in time down the road. Well, we're in a time period right now of Israel. We're past the point of King David, King Solomon, and some good kings, and we've moved into the realm of kings who decided they don't need God anymore. They don't want God in the kingdom anymore. And we're going to look at Ahab. Ahab and his wife, Jezebel. And that should ring some bells in some people's head. Because we illustrate to her a lot, and all these, well, that's a Jezebel over there, well, that's a Jezebel over there. Well, what are we really saying? What we're saying is someone who does not believe in God, does not want God in their life, and despises God, and would rather push God away. That's Ahab. Ahab married a wife like that, who is not an Israelite, and it cost him his life and kingdom. At this point, though, Israel has went totally astray. They've ripped down all the altars of God. They've ripped down the temple and just tore off everything that had God in it and put the practice of Baal and Asherah in it, which were blood sacrifices and sexual sacrifices. So, boom, we got all this evil going on. God says, I don't want that. And what do you do? You put it in there. So, Israel, you don't care? Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get your attention. So, he tells his prophet, one of the last remaining ones, there's a hundred more hiding in caves. All the rest have been annihilated because of Jezebel, he tells Samuel, you go to Ahab, and you let him know for three years there's going to be a drought, and then you walk away. I want you to go up, get active in the playing field, but then go sit on the bench for three years, and stay on the bench, don't get in the game, stay out. So he does. And for three years, Israel suffers drought like they've never had before. And there's nothing growing, and they're starving, and Ahab is looking for Samuel and can't find him. God then says, Samuel, it's time to get off the bench and get in the playing field. It's time to get back on the field. It's time to get active again. So Samuel goes to a buddy of his who's assistant to the king and says, look, I know Ahab's been looking for me to kill me. And I know if the person who goes to him and tells him, here is Ahab, and I'm, or here is Samuel, and I'm not here, he's going to kill that person. But I'm going to tell you something. You go tell Ahab, I'll be right here waiting on him, me and him, face to face, only me and him, and I won't move. Now, this guy's a little scared, but he, he does it. Ahab meets Samuel. Samuel says, here's the deal, dude. I'm going to pull back the drought now. I'm going to call back the rain, but it's going to take a situation to happen first. You've got to meet me in some bartering here. And the barter deal is this. You get all the people of Israel and the prophets of Asherah and Baal, all 850 of them, on Mount Carmel on this day. And from there, I will dictate the rest. But I'll bring back the rain if you hold to your barter. And he does. And that takes us to our scriptures today. 1 Kings 18, 20-40. So Ahab sent to all the people of Israel and gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel. And Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you go limping between the two different opinions. If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. Now we have to keep a visual here on this mountainside. The people are coming up the mountain. The prophets are over here on this side of the mountain. Samuel keeps his distance. Because the prophets didn't come looking like, hey, we're all prophets, we're in sheets, we're all cool. No, they came with weapons. They came to do battle against Samuel. So Samuel's keeping a barrier, a long distance between the people and the prophets. He's like, look, I'm over here, I'm safe right now. In case someone wants to come at me, I've got an exit out. Just keep that in mind, guys. As you're down there and over there, I'm over here. All on our own neutral ground. He then says, Elijah said to the people, I, even I only, am left a prophet of the Lord. But all the prophets are 450 men. Let the two poles be given to us, and let them choose one bowl for themselves, and cut it in pieces, and lay it on the wood, but put no fire on it. And I will prepare the other bowl, and lay it on the wood, and put no fire on it. And you call upon the name of the, your God, and I will call upon the name of the Lord, and the God who answered by the fire, he is God. And all the people answered, it is well spoken. So here's what goes on. Samuel looks at the Israelites, the nation out there. 
He says, you guys are the judge and jury of this contest we're getting ready to have. So I'm going to lay out some rules, and you say, yeah, you're nay to the rules. If you think they're fair, two thumbs up, we'll do it. If you don't, then we won't do it, and all of it goes back to where it was. And he looks at the congregation out there, the judges and the jury, and he says, we're going to give each of us a bowl. We're each going to cut it up, but neither one can light the fire. And the one who gets their God to light it up, boom, that's the real God. The other one is a false God. And now the decision will be made. Whom will you serve? Then he looks at the prophets, and he's going to tell them this. He's going to remind them of the rules. Then Elijah said to the prophets of all, in verse 25, Choose for yourselves one bowl and prepare it first. For you are many, and call upon the name of your God. But put no fire to it. And they took the bowl that was given them, and they prepared it, and called upon the name of all from morning till noon, saying, Oh, bowl, answer us. But there was no voice and no one answered. Hold on right there for a moment. Elijah, or Sam, no, it is Elijah. Elijah, I'm sorry, I've been telling you the wrong guy all this long time. I'm sorry. We were talking in Sunday school. Bob's like, you lay out around you where I got you. Elijah gives them the opportunity to pick the best of the two bulls. He's saying, look, you guys, your God, if you feel he's a real God, you get first choice. Give him the best bowl that's going to get his attention. And I'll choose the second best for my God. Both of them are blemishless, but I want you to have the best opportunity here. I want to give you the grade up. I'm going to help you out. Elijah like steps back and says, now remember, you cannot put a fire to it. That would be breaking the rules. And so he allows them to go on, and they call to their God, and it says that they left around the altar that they had made. And at noon, Elijah, and I love this part, mocks them, saying, cry aloud, cry louder. Not all of you are crying out to God. Some of you are just dancing around the altar. Some of you are crying out to your God. But that's not getting anyone's attention here. So maybe he's relieving himself. Maybe he's on the toilet. Maybe he's in an outhouse somewhere. I, and that's why I bring your God. It's, oh, 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 if not there, maybe he's on a journey somewhere. And he can't hear you, so cry louder. Or perhaps he's asleep and must be awoken. And they cried aloud and cut themselves after their custom with the swords and lances. See, I told you they came for battle. They had swords and lances. And until the blood gushed upon them. So they started out with little bitty cuts. Because Baal worship is about blood sacrifice. And they're throwing the blood on the altar and crying out, but that's not getting anywhere. So then they cut themselves deeper and deeper to the point that the blood that is flowing out of them is draining them. They're becoming lifeless. And this was kind of Elijah's goal. Knowing how they would behave, taunt them far enough, and they're going to put themselves in jeopardy. And that was his goal at this point. Put them down so they couldn't resist as well. <coughs> and it says, as midday passed, they raved on until the time of the offering of Oblation. That means the time that was set for the altar to be lit. Elijah says, you have from this point in the day to this point in the day get that altar lit. And if it doesn't light, then it's my turn. The time for the altar to be lit is over. And he says, look, okay. Elijah's turn. Then in verse 30, then Elijah said to the people, come near to me. See how he keeps them at a distance? Now he says, no, 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 come on up, come on up, come close to me. I want to talk to you now. Since you're judge and jury, I want you to see what I'm about to do with the power of God. Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord came, saying to the Israelites, Israel shall be your name. He reminds them of who they are. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two saves of seed, which is about two feet wide and about two feet deep. And he put the wood in the order and cut the bowl in pieces and laid it on the wood. And he said, fill four jars with water and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. Now, where did they get the water from? Well, they're on a mountain. Mountains have rivers. Mountains have streams. And mountains have springs. So they have jars with them. And they start filling it up. Big jar, big water jar, about this big. And about that big around. And they fill four of them up. And they soak it. Now, the writer says, that's cool. That's great. Now, do 
it a second time. And then it says they did it a second time. And he said, that's a lot of water. Do it a third time. So they do it a third time. And they did it a third time. And the water ran around the altar and filled the trench also with water. So imagine this. The cow, or the bull actually, is setting in water. The wood that the bull's setting on is underwater. The water is so much that it's overflowing like a waterfall into the ditch around it and filling the ditch up. And the water is just running off. There's a major amount. No way physically that Elijah could stand there and throw a match on the ground and light it somehow. And that's another reason why he wanted the ditch dug. To prove that there was no physical way a human would light that fire. It could not happen. By any means of dropping some kind of lighting equipment behind him and it just shooting up on onto the altar and lighting the altar. And at the time of the offering of the oblation, at the moment it was time that he had said, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel. He reminds the people, the judges and the jury that are out there, you are the people of Israel. You are God's people. I've just given you your heritage and you know this. And he says, and that I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned their hearts back. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust, and it licked up the water that was in the trench. That's a good representation of what happened, I think. Fire from heaven that fell on Sodom and Gomorrah came down on that altar, and the stones burnt up, and the dust that the stones made burnt up. The water that was there was incinerated as well. So there's no water, there's no altar, there's no dust of the altar left. God took everything and boom, it's all gone. Instantly. <coughs> Nothing left. Now, was Elijah standing by it? No, he was near it enough that he could say, look, this is the power of God, look what you see here. But he wasn't right beside it. When the people saw it, they <laughs> fell on their faces and said, the Lord, he is God. And then they emphasized it. The Lord, he is God. And Elijah said to them, seize the prophets of all, let none of them escape, and they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook of Kishon and slaughtered them there. Why not just slaughter them where they are? Why not just eliminate them right where they are and be done with it? Well, there's some symbolic reasoning here. We have a baptistry here. When you get baptized in the water, what happens to your sins? They're washed away. They're no longer a part of you. Elijah says to the people, to the judges and the jury, you grab these prophets. You take them down to the river where we will wash them away from us, where all their taint is gone from Israel. And Elijah is the one who executes them, it says. But the people have a hand in it. Keep that in mind. The people have a hand in this. They have to take the sin that they had to the river and watch it wash away and watch it cleanse them. That's why he does that there and not anywhere else. We see something about Elijah. He could not stand by and just be a witness. He could not stand by and say, hey, I want to tell you guys about the God that you should know about. How you're doing wrong and you need to turn around. I want to witness to you at this point, but he couldn't just stop there. His heart was for the people. His heart felt for them. He, he cried out for them. And yet they ignored him most of the time. He says, fine, I'm now going to minister to them as well. So he witnesses to them and he ministers to them. And we need to understand that. That there was a dual thing going on here with Elijah. The witnessing took place when he said, how long will you go limping between the two different opinions? If Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. See, he witnesses to him. He says, look, I want to tell you about God. But they already know about God, so he just reminds them real quick. The ministering took place when he said, seize the prophets. Seize 
sees them and takes them down. Let none of them escape. Sees them and Elijah brought them down to the brook of Kishon and slaughtered them there. That's where the witnessing comes. He says, look, they're your stumbling block. This is a roadblock in your life. You need to overcome this roadblock, and I'm here to help you do that. I'm here to help you get rid of the ball out of your life. So you're going to get a hand in this. You're going to own up to it, and you're going to physically get rid of this for yourselves. I'm not going to do it all for you. Ministering is helping someone get through something. And so he helps them. Now, I know you're asking me, Ron, is there really a difference between witnessing and ministering? Is it two different fields or is it the same? Well, yes it is. It is different. How is it different? Well, witnessing is a one-time commitment. It's a one-time thing you do and not for people in the believers. It's for the non-believers. It's for the people who have not accepted Jesus. That's what witnessing is for. You don't go witnessing to someone who already believes in Jesus. Because that would just be a practice session. That would be you sharpening someone's stone so both of you can go witness. But it's not, hey, you're trying to convert someone, right? Because they're already converted over to Christ. They already know who he is. So you don't witness to a believer. What you do is do a ministry. And that is an extended commitment. One, witnessing, I can go up, say hi, 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 minutes, and I can walk away and done, I'm done. But in ministry, when you minister, that's an extended time. That's an indefinite time until God says, okay, you're done with that ministry. It's time for you to move on. You don't choose, God does for you. Elijah understood that. Elijah said, these people need a witness and they need a minister. And Ahab, you're not doing it. You chose not to minister to these people, so now I have to do this because they need a shepherd. They are lost sheep without it. So he takes on his role as minister. He gets off the bench and gets active in the field and says, God, I want to be the quarterback. Give me the ball and let me run with this team. We will own this game and we will win it for you. And that's what he does for a time. So now we need to look at this and remember that God praises the faith, the witnesses and ministers. So, Scripture, Paul wants to remind us what witnessing is about and why we need to witness. So he reminds us, what I like to call the witnessing conviction, is in Romans 10, 14. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they, they being a non-believer, on him is Jesus Christ. So when we look at this, how will the non-believer call on Jesus on whom they do not believe? And how are they, the non-believer, to believe in Jesus of whom they've never heard of? And how are they to hear about Jesus without someone preaching or witnessing? Paul lays it out for the Romans who are struggling right now. The Romans, who are Christians, just have assumed everyone knows about Jesus. They've assumed that everyone should know about him because they've heard about him, so the rest of the world should know about him. So hey, why should we tell them anymore about him? They should just come right over to the faith. And Paul reminds them, look, how are they supposed to hear about Jesus? How are they supposed to come over and believe if no one has went to them? If no one has taken the time to talk to them about it? If no one has ever heard about Jesus, they can't come talk about Jesus. They can't come believe in Jesus if they've never heard about him. It's an impossibility. So he tells them, look, you have to witness. You don't have a choice in this fact. You have to do this. And secondly, we have the ministering conviction. Paul understands that Timothy is kind of running a church now. But the church isn't using the Bible to their best abilities. They're not using it accordingly as they should. So he has to remind them, as well as us, the ministering is equally as important as witnessing. And he says this in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching. Who's 
still get taught. Well, it's the new believer coming in. You use that Bible to teach the new believer the ways that make God happy, the commitments God says to do, the convictions God says you're supposed to have, the lifestyle you're supposed to live. That's what you use scriptures for and for reproof. How many of you want to know sometimes when you're getting ready to make a big decision, is this what God really wants me to do? Does God really want me to do this? Well, the scriptures are full of answers for that. There's not one question you can ask that God does not have in his scriptures somewhere to tell you. Now, you might have to read into it a little bit. You might have to use some logic, but it's there. So God says, look, he tells Timothy, in your church, when people want to know should they do this as believers, the Bible has the answer. Read it. And it says, it's good for correction. When a brother or a sister goes astray, when a brother or sister who is sinning purposely, you grab your Bible and you show them in their life, look, God says with that behavior not to do it. God is talking to you, not me, but God is coming to you through me telling you, hey, look, that behavior is wrong. Now keep in mind everything I'm saying right now. And finally, for training in righteousness. For the believer who's been in the church for a year, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 50 years. It doesn't matter. There's always something in there that we can read to gain better righteousness with Christ, to grow our faith with him. So the Bible is not just something that new people need to read and those who are doing wrong need to read, but it's also for everyone to read that is in the church. <clears throat> Now, I point out that there's two differences between witnessing and ministry. And that's because we've hurt ourselves. We've shot ourselves in the foot as Christians. We do it every day and probably don't realize it. How do we hurt ourselves? We've been hurting ourselves for several generations now because we've mixed up what witnessing is and what ministering is. We have the philosophy and the ideology that that world out there of non-believers... That world out there needs to be like us. We go out there and we say, all right, look, you're doing wrong. Let me, let me tell you how you're doing wrong. You're doing wrong because Jesus says that's not how we're supposed to live. That's wrong lifestyle. You shouldn't do that. We go to our, our uh, mayors and our people in offices and we go to businesses and we try to tell them that's evil. Stop doing that. Who needs to hear what evil is and stop doing. It's us. We are the followers of Christ. They don't know Christ. So how can we go to them and say, Christ says that's wrong, stop doing that. We're going, and who's Christ? Why should I listen to him? But we try to impose the lifestyle that we have on everyone else before we witness to them and let them see what faith is. Do you see the problem there? We've made them enemies before we even begin to talk to them about who Christ is. We've told them, look, this is how you're supposed to live without giving them a reason, without giving them a logical explanation. We've turned them off. We are the light. In here is where we do the corrections. In here in our body is where we do the correcting and the reproofing and the righteous living out there. We're supposed to treat them like babies. You wouldn't give a baby a bottle and a formula and some water and another thing and tell them mix it themselves and feed it themselves, would you? The baby would starve to death. They are babies. They don't know. So we have to mix it up for them and give it to them like a baby bottle. We have to bring Jesus to them very simply and say, Jesus loves you. Let me tell you why he loves you. Now, do you want that love to continue? Why don't you come over here and let me talk to you more about that. Let me show you who Jesus is. It's like putting the cart before the horse. It's not going to go anywhere, is it? You put that cart in front of that horse, and that horse is going to look at that cart and go, okay, now what? And it's a useless thing then. It's lost its purpose. We have to remember, when we go out and talk to the world out there, we're not to condemn them in that way. We're not to say, hey, you're doing wrong. We do that here. We watch over each other here, but we're not the watchers over there. We're only the light bringers. We only bring Jesus to them. We say, hey, let me tell you about Jesus. Let me show you Jesus. Not let me 
rate your lifestyle according to how I'm living. Because that's wrong. And yet, we do it and we hurt ourselves. Elijah was personally convicted. Elijah looked at the field of play and said, I am convicted, God. I am convicted. Not only do they need a witness, but they need ministry. They need this. And I'm the man that needs to do this, God. And God says, you know what, Elijah? I see your conviction. I know you, and I will praise you. And Elijah got a blessing that none but one other had. And that was, he never saw death face to face. He never had to shake hands with death and say, hey, welcome. God brought a chariot from heaven and said, get on. You get a free ticket up. You're going to get to go right to paradise. You don't have to go to the grave. I'm not going to make you do that. I'm going to allow you a privilege beyond privilege because I recognize your faith. I recognize it and I want to praise you and I want someone to know about it. And who knew about it? Elisha was there to see it all happen and record it. It's because of his conviction. So let me ask you in closing, what is your conviction for your church? What is your conviction for your church? What do you see your church needing? What are you willing to do for your church to help it be the church that God has called it to be? Secondly, where's your conviction for your family? Where do you stand as a parent? Where do you stand as a sibling? Where do you stand as a husband or a wife for your family? What is your conviction? Is your conviction... Well, my family knows the Bible. They know who Jesus is. Now it's all, all on them to choose. Or is it? I'm still alive. My family still needs ministering. Despite the fact they live in my house or not, they still need ministering. Or maybe they still need witnessing to. My conviction is that, that until I'm dead, I'm the light to them. Thirdly, what's your conviction for your community? Is it one, well, you know, someone will talk to them. Someone will let them know about Jesus. Or is it, yeah, I'm not going to wait. The Lord is my God. Lord, you're my God, and because you're my God, I'm going to do what you tell me to do, and I'm going to go witness. I'm not going to sit back and wait for someone else to do it. Yeah, I might stumble in my tongue, and yeah, I might not say everything right, but if we keep it simple, does it really matter? God speaks through us. The Holy Spirit moves through us. All we got to do is open our mouth and start talking. And you'll be amazed what happens and what it said. And yeah, you might get a lot of doors slammed in your face. But what is your conviction for your community? And finally, will your life and your life's convictions receive praise from God? That's the ultimate thing you better ask yourself. Am I doing what is going to receive praise from God? Is my faith praiseworthy? We're going to stand and sing now.